is saying my, my marriage with my wife is a religion. No, it's not. It's a relationship. It's much more than religion because Christianity is not just about beliefs and practices. You know, some of you Patriots fans are religious. Some of you Bronco fans are religious. Some of you Heat fans are religious in the sense that you have a set of beliefs and practices in which you participate in every week and you think that your teams are like little gods, you know? So the point of it is uh, uh, that you know, anything could be a religion, but everything can't be a relationship. And that's the same way with Christianity. It's Christianity transcends religious world views or religious practices because it's about a dynamic relationship with the living and resurrected God. And, and so there's something very mystical about this. There's very, something very organic about our relationship with the Lord. So today as we talk about the power of something new, I want you to basically leave here today with a sense that, man, I need to be more in God's Word. I need to understand God's Word, just like we did with that little quick skit, you know, improv skit. The only weapon that we have to overcome deception is God's Word, and we're going to look at that in three points today. Sorry we didn't have the bulletins. As you can see, this was a crazy week. Uh, uh, video problems, bulletin problems, but it's all good. God is still good. Amen? Amen. Uh, and I thank God that none of you guys come to church over these technicalities or else we'd all be in trouble. But it's really about love. It's about loving Jesus and about loving each other as a church. So today I want to impact you with these three points. The first point that I want to talk about is the example we see concerning God's Word. The example we see concerning God's Word. If you're a note taker and you can find a piece of paper or you want to write it somewhere, um, the first thing that I want to highlight is the example we see of God's Word. The second point that I want to leave you with, I'm sorry, the first point was the expectation of God's Word, and the second point was the example of God's Word. And the last point, the third point, is the encouragement concerning God's Word. So the first one is the expectation concerning God's Word. The second point is the example of God's Word, which will answer the question, how? Like, how do we grow in God's Word? What are the examples that the Bible gives to us? And the last point is the encouragement that you guys, as we leave, we can be people who understand God's Word and we can grow in the knowledge of it and begin to apply it. And I'm gonna say something to you. Look, you can have all the positive thinking in the world. You can go out of here and just um, try to get control of your life and your thoughts, but it's impossible to do that without God's Word. God's Word will bring meaning into your life. And I've been really reflecting on this lately. Because, you know, as you think about your life, life is really about meaning. You know, philosophers call that exist existentialism. What's the existential meaning of life? Why do I exist? And think about everything that you do, from going to work, from having kids, to getting married, to just working out. It's really about your existence. You're trying to experience joy. You're trying to experience a quality of life. Okay? But I would say to you that God's Word can change your perspective about life. Perfect example. Uh, we just moved to a new house and basically I was walking through the front yard and I noticed that the yard was really kind of getting yellow, starting to look real ugly. And I don't know if this happens to you, but you start looking at things around your, your room or your house or your yard, your car, it looks really dirty, that someone scratched it with a key and you're just like, man, my car sucks. My yard sucks, you know what I mean? And then from there I start looking at the grass and then I start looking at the walls and I'm like, oh man, there's a paint peeling over here. <laughs> oh man, look at that window, it's cracked. And I started noticing how my mind started doing this downward spiral of negativity. In a sense that I started looking at all the ugly, messed up, cracked things in my life. Does that happen to you guys or is it just me? Yeah. Okay, and immediately it was like God just confronted me with this word just confronted me. And, 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 and with, with, in Philippians, Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. That one little verse, that one little thinking that you need to be grateful, you need to be thankful. And then the minute I started saying, you know, Lord, I thank you for this house. I thank you for my car. I mean, you know, I mean, my car is dirty, but the minute I get it, to go, get it washed, it's like, oh, wow, I love my car. And what happened? 
A dirty car makes you feel bad, a, good, a clean car makes you feel good. But when it's dirty, you just feel like, you know what, my whole life is dirty. I don't know about you guys, but last week I had to get a haircut. And lately I've noticed the older I get, if I don't get a haircut, the minute it starts to grow out into this weird kind of afro, I get really depressed. I just, I mean, I, this is the, I mean, it happens to women. Okay? Especially black women, they kind of get their hair done. My wife, I mean, I, I, I will sit, I don't care, I, if I'm broke, I'm sending my wife to get her hair done. Okay? Men, the secret of having a woman happy, black, white, Latino, let her get her hair done. Okay? Because I'm telling you, they will change, and I'm telling you, that's been happening to me. I think she put a curse on me so I can sympathize, because now I'm just like, go, go. And, 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 I, will, and, and I used to be the kind of guy where my, if my hair was looking bad, I didn't care. I would just, you know, still do my thing, but now it's like when my hair is looking bad, it's like, I feel depressed. I feel like something's wrong with my life, you know? And, and, and maybe it's one of those things where I feel like I need to control things, you know, I don't know. But the whole point of it is, I will get my hair done, I'll just feel ready to go party. Like, hey, baby, what do you mean? hey, can we drop off the kids at, at grandma's tonight? And like, let's go out, you know? And I, and I think that's why my wife lets me get my hair done now, because it, a date always follows that, you know? But, you know, it's so true. When you look good, you feel good. And I think that's why the Bible talks about taking care of ourselves. The Bible is very concerned about diet when you get into Leviticus. It's concerned about, you know, oiling, uh, anointing yourself with oil. And these were perfumes. These were fragrances. You know, the Bible, you know, talks about these things because God is beautiful. Amen. You know, and, and even though the world is ugly and it's sinned and it's messed up, God's presence. So when I started thinking real negative about the grass, my car, the peeling wall, God's word just came and encouraged me, rejoice. I'm with you, Jack, and where I am, I make things beautiful. I bring beauty. I turn water into wine. Amen? Think about it. Water at a wedding. People are in trouble. And Jesus steps in because of his mother's request and turns the water into wine. Jesus turns our water into wine. Amen? And that's where he comes in with his word and he comes in with his spirit and he breathes new perspective. And my prayer has been for our church, fresh wind, fresh fire, Lord. That's where God comes over his people and he changes them. And the first point I made on the first week of this series and the power of something new, and I talked about the gift of exaltation, Acts 2, where the Holy Spirit came on that church on the day of Pentecost. And it breathed power over them. Tongues of fire came to rest upon them. And they began to declare the wonders of God. Here they were, a small group of 150 people. They were basically being persecuted. And God gave them boldness. God gave them power because of His Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is moving in the lives of people, He brings fresh perspective. He brings fresh power. He does something new. And last week we talked about the gift of evangelism, that as we become filled with the Holy Spirit of God, as we get filled with the Word of God, we ought to be given that compassion and be giving that to other people, inviting them to walk with the Lord, inviting them to step into our lives, inviting them to come and worship with us. The gift of evangelism not only becomes a blessing to other people, but like Jesus said, those who go forth in my name will not fail to receive a hundred times here on this earth and a hundred times in the world to come, heaven. So there's a, there's a blessing, a reward attached in being the evangelist, one who goes out and tells people the good news. The good news is what? The beautiful God, the holy God, the righteous God is trying to invade the ugliness of our life, the sinfulness of our life, the depravity of our life, the hell-boundness of our life. We're all going to hell without Christ, Ephesians 2 dead in our trespasses and sin, but God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ Jesus. That's the gospel, that God brings life. He brings wine where there's plainness of water. He brings beauty where there's ugliness. So today, we need to understand, y'all, we need to put this in our, in our hearts, that it is essential that we allow ourselves to learn and to reflect and to regurgitate and digest the word of the living God. And even if you're busy, even though I've been busy these last two weeks since the new year, I haven't been busy enough to get at least one verse into my system. Amen? Amen. I haven't been busy enough to not turn on Christian radio and get the Word of God preached to me. 
I haven't been busy enough on my app, on the Android. You can download a, a, a Bible software. Um, it's called, um, I forgot the name, um, uh, New Version, and there's a few other ones. And you can listen to it audibly. You can just listen to God's Word. Because sometimes you don't feel like reading the Word because you're just tired. And you're like, Man, I, can't, I don't want to read anything. Just listening to the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing, by hearing the Word of God. Because what happens, our perspectives are constantly bound by the law of entropy. You naturally become negative. You naturally become disorganized. You naturally become decayed as a human being. Everything is moving towards the law of entropy. That means it's moving towards disorder and decay. So you don't have to do anything except just be a human and you'll become negative. You'll start disbelieving. You will become morally uh, corrupt just by your human nature. That's why you have to work hard to smell good, look good, think positive, to be strong. I mean, that takes effort. You gotta build yourself up in the Word of God. So today, I wanna show you three uh, primary points. The expectation of the Word of God, the example of the Word of God, and the encouragement to live out the Word of God. If you turn to Luke chapter two, we can see here the expectation to know God's Word. In Luke chapter two, verse 41, Sorry, we don't have it up on the uh, screen, and I usually put the scriptures in the bulletin, but like I said, we didn't have a chance to print them out this week. But thank God you guys have your Bible apps on your phone, and you brought your Bibles with you. Amen? So, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Here we see a passage that really defines the expectation of knowing God's Word. Okay? And again, I'm, I feel convicted because I haven't been in God's Word eating the steak. I've just been eating, eating the snacks on the run. But you better eat something. And something is better than nothing. Amen? When you're going through a very fast and crazy season of your life, you have to still keep eating. you got to still keep drinking. But in Luke chapter 2, verse 41, it says, Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. This was a yearly uh, feast that God established in the Old Testament, symbolizing his deliverance from Egypt where he killed all the firstborn sons of, of Egypt, and God passed over uh, the Jews as they put blood on their doorposts, symbolizing the future blood of Jesus Christ, in which God will pass over his judgment in our lives as the blood of Jesus is over us. It says, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. And it says, after the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them. Look at this. Listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Did you know I had to be in my father's house? Some translations say my father's business, about my father's business, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. If you turn to Luke 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert. Notice the Spirit leads him to make war with Satan. There's a warfare to the kingdom. Okay? And then he says, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. But Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God 
and serve him only. So here's a few verses, Luke 2, Luke 4. Luke 2 captures Jesus at age 12. What is he doing in the temple? He's learning and discussing about the law with the teachers of the law. At 12 years old, Jesus is learning and teaching the word of God. There's two things going on there. But then you see Jesus at age 30 during the desert temptation. What is, how does Jesus respond to Satan's temptations? With the, word of God. With the word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. So the first point that I want to make to you guys here today is the expectation of knowing God's word. The expectation of knowing God's word. You see it in the life of Jesus. Now if you turn to Luke, I mean to Acts 2, I won't, I won't read it uh, directly from the scriptures, but it says in Acts 2, uh, verses 42 to 47, it talks about what the early church did. And one of the things it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship, and, the, and, and all these different things. So, so the first point, you guys, is there's a, there's a strong expectation in scriptures that we learn and know and use the word of God in our lives. Because God's word is a weapon. Ephesians 6, in describing the armor of God, says the sword of the spirit is what? The word of God. Okay, this week, as we move into the new house, um, man, when we, when we walked in there, uh, there was no ants. It was just nice, clean house. Within 24 hours, all these ants came from everywhere. I mean, partly it was our fault. We got some soda cans out and this and that. And, and, but I mean, ants in my closet, all of my clothes. I'm thinking, is it our cologne, our perfume? I, I mean, how do you get ants in your closet? walking all over your clothes. And it was a trip, I was like, man, I, I think, man, we're gonna be battling ants in the rest of, for the rest of our time here in this house. I mean, they came from everywhere. And, and so I went to the old house, and I remember I had some, some of that uh, ant uh, exterminator and it's ant repellent. It basically kills the ants and it repels them for up to 12 months. Yeah, right, you know? Um, but I had bought this from Home Depot a few months ago. So I'm going around the house, basically creating these boundaries. I'm spraying this stuff in order to keep the ants out. And praise the Lord, no ants. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a few that are creeping into the areas that I haven't sprayed. But the point of it is when I was spraying this repellent, I know it works because it worked in our, in our old house, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is how it is when people have the invisible shield of the armor on around their families. You know, we pray, God, put a hedge of protection on my family. What are you saying? You're putting, you're putting repellent and exterminator power around your house to keep the demons out, to keep the negativity and the darkness out, to keep the curses out. And if you don't believe in curses, you don't believe in demons, you need to understand that is the first century world of Jesus. I know in this world we're kind of scientific and we tend not to believe in the evil powers of the, of the enemy, but they're real. And so God just spoke to me, this is, Jack, this is what it's like when you're praying. This is what it's like when you're standing on the word of God, when you're giving your kids the word of God, when you're allowing the word of God to be played in your house, when you're talking about the word of God. You're creating an invisible repellent and exterminator around not only your soul, but around your family and around your church. Because sometimes, I'm, I gotta be honest with you guys, as a pastor, I'm like, okay, what can I do? What kind of, you know, what can I do? Um, maybe, maybe if I, you know, painted my hair blonde, uh, the church will get excited and, and, and get closer to Jesus. Uh, uh, some crazy thoughts like, I'm just gonna come here bleach blonde one day, like blue, blue eye contacts, I don't know. But just, like, just trip people out, do something weird. But then God just says, hey, Pastor Jeff, sit your butt down. You need to do what I told you to do in Scripture. I've outlined for you as a pastor what you need to be doing. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. And one of the number one responsibilities as a shepherd is to feed God's people the Word of God. It's to give people the Word of God. 
Paul told Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Don't just encourage them. Tell them everything's going to be okay. Correct them. Help them to, to start thinking properly, to think appropriately about things. Some of your sheep have a very negative mindset about their identity. When they look at themselves, they don't think they can do great things for God. You need to, you need to change the way they, you need to correct their thinking in an encouraging way that they are powerful in Christ. That's why Paul spends so much time in the Word of God talking about our identity in Christ. Read Ephesians chapter 1 and 3. Read Romans chapter 1 to 8. Paul will always write his letters spending the first half telling us our identity in Christ before he tells us what we need to be doing. So many times from the pulpit, churches, we only hear what we're supposed to be doing. Do this, do that, pray more, give more. But we don't hear enough of our identity in Christ, what grace has done for us and in us through the Holy Spirit. Because once we know who we are in Christ and our, and our value and the power that we have, then we can start living out. Because only when you understand that you're a prince and you're a princess, do you start acting like a prince and a princess. Amen? Long as you think you're a loser, you're ugly, I'm cursed, you know, we need to stop listening to these voices. And everyone has guilt. Whites have what they call, sociologists call white guilt. They feel bad over slavery. Haitians feel cursed because of what people told them. Your nation was cursed, you guys gave your soul to the devil. African Americans feel, you know, inhibited because of their ancestry and all the stuff that happened to them. Latinos feel marginalized because Latin America is, 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 is still, you know, trying to compete with the, with, the, with the nations. Everyone has a history that affects their present identity. And then we come from dysfunctional families. Our parents were messed up. And then we have the voices in our minds telling us what you can't do and what you can't do. This is why it's important, you guys, for us to hear God's word. To know who we are as human beings in Christ Jesus first. That my identity is first, I'm a Christian. And all my ancestral uh, um, garbage and all my family baggage and all this stuff is secondary in comparison to what the Word of God says, who I am in Christ Jesus. Amen? And you got to internalize this. this. You have to reflect on this. And you can't do this if you don't have a high expectancy and an understanding of the potency of what God's word can do. Jesus at 12 years old is concerned. Jesus in spiritual warfare, he doesn't just babble off anything. He could have just said anything to Satan. He created the God. He said, Satan, I created you. Shut up. But you know what he does? It is written. It is written. It is written because the very scriptures that he quotes was the very scriptures that Jesus himself inspired through the agency of the Holy Spirit. The second point I want to give to you today is the examples. Now the question becomes, Pastor, how do I do this? I know I need to go to church, I know I need to do certain things, but how do I get the Word of God more in me? How do I become more powerful? I want to give you just a few verses. Turn to Psalm 119 real quick. Psalm 119, verse 11. You go, who knows that verse? But who, who's already put that verse in their hearts? Psalm 119, verse 11. It's a very famous verse. It's a Sunday school verse, but it's very powerful when you understand the potency of this one little truth. Psalm 119, verse 11. Can someone with a good, loud voice stand up and just read that verse? There we go. Someone back. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I have hidden your word in my heart, God. Why? I'm telling you, man, when temptation comes... <laughs> Man, I don't care how positive you try to think about that. I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> no, this is not good. And, and none of those, not, none of that stuff will work when temptation comes. And you see, you guys know, temptation never comes in ways that looks ugly and unattractive to you. Temptation always comes packaged, <laughs> delivered in a way that looks perfect for you. I'm telling you. David says, Psalm 119 is, an, is, is a full-length psalm in which he just 
reflects on the beauty of God's word. I encourage you to read it when you go home today. But this one key verse, strong application, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Today, I have an assignment for you. By next week, now, no one's going to come to church now, watch. Whenever, whenever pastors give out assignments, no one comes to church the next week. It's like, oh, he's going to quiz me. He's going to call me. I, I promise I won't call you to the stage because you ain't doing this for me. Trust me. I'm a, I'm a worm, like David said in the Psalms. I'm a sinner. Don't ever do anything for people. Your boss, your spouses. The Bible says whatever you do, you do it in the name of the Lord for Jesus' sake. If you do anything as people as the primary motive, you will lose your motivation. You will... You will lose your energy because we're, I, we're, we're nothing. We, we can't reward you the way Christ can reward you. But do this for the sake of the Lord. I want you by this next week to memorize Psalm 119 verse 11. I have hidden thy word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Folks, let me tell you something. As you hide God's word in your heart and you carry it with you throughout the day, David, the psalmist, the poet is saying, look, this thing will keep you from sinning. Think about all the stupid things that you did this week. Think about all the stupid things you did and said. And I say, I, I do a lot of them every week. And, and when I look back, I could have stopped it if I was reflecting on God's word right before that situation. And we get in trouble because we don't put that invisible exterminator on. We don't prepare ourselves for the day. So, the example that we see in scripture, the first point is, memorize God's word, put it inside of you. Okay, the second point is, come to church more frequently. Turn to Acts 2, Acts chapter 2. Look what it says in Acts 2, verse 42. Acts 2, verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves this is the church that was birthed after Jesus' resurrection. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You guys see that? And to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The early church was devoted to fellowship, was devoted to get together and to study God's word. And I want to encourage you, devote yourself. Tell yourself, you know what? I want to go to a Bible-believing church. God may not send you to this church, but, he may, but He's going to send you somewhere where you're going to be studying the Word of God. You're going to be studying themes that come from the Word of God. Memorize God's Word. Attend church frequently. And then the last point is what Jesus did in the desert for 40 days. Speak God's word. Speak it. You see that in, in Luke 4. When Jesus was tempted with, by the enemy, he didn't just memorize it and keep it hidden. And just so you understand, look at Luke chapter 4. Look what it says in verse 16. It says, he went to Nazareth, Luke 4 verse 16, where he had been brought up, and on a Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, verse 16, as was his custom. And he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. What do you see there in Jesus? Jesus, all of his life, went to the synagogue every Sabbath, every Saturday. In the book of Acts, we know that change to Sunday, people started worshiping on the day of the Lord, which is the day of the resurrection. But what's the principle there? Jesus was a faithful, regular church attender. And what did they do in the synagogue? They opened the scrolls and they read from the scriptures. And the way they would teach is the rabbis would, would read a small portion of scripture and then they would expound or exposit those scriptures or build themes on key points in that scripture. Sort of the, sort of the way we do here at this church. 
We always want to open the Word of God. We always want to get into the Word of God. I stopped my teaching through Genesis for a few months in order to deal with some key themes that our church needed to go through in this time of transition. Just in case some of you guys are wondering, what happened to Genesis? Well, Genesis is still there. But, but the Holy Spirit started to show me you need to be dealing with some key themes as a, as a relaunch church and almost get back to basics of what it means to be a Christian. And I can see how God is strengthening us and, and he's doing an awesome work. But what's the point? Regular worship attendance is very critical. Of course, we have different things that come up. And when you miss church, you shouldn't beat yourself up like you committed the unpardonable sin. But there should be a sense that, man, I need to be in the house of God. I need to show up. The body of Christ needs me. And the last point I want to give to you guys today is the encouragement concerning God's word. That is, many of us have tried to start new diets and we've already failed. That's why I don't even try to start them. I have a seafood diet, whatever I see, I eat. Amen. No, I've actually been doing better this week. Remember last week I talked about my wife fasting and, and me being a glutton and my rebelliousness? I actually took that to the Lord. I said, Lord, I know I was joking around with the congregation, but am I being rebellious? He said, yup. Yeah. <laughs> That's your problem, you're always rebellious. But um, I took that to the Lord and the Lord said, yeah, you know what? You're, um, you're kind of out of control right now. And, and, and the Lord really showed me what it was, um, stress. You know, when we're stressed out, we have coping mechanisms, things that we do to make ourselves feel good. And for me, it's been eating a lot, you know? And just eat, and eating ridiculous kind of foods. Like I'm pregnant or something. I eat a, I'll eat a burrito, then eat some Asian uh, soup that we bought from Costco, and then turn around and eat some hummus, and it's just like, like you know, and it's just uh, like, why am I doing this? The taste, the eating is helping me to do something physical to get my mind off all the stress that I have. And so the Lord helped me pinpoint where my overindulgence is, is connected, is that I haven't been taking all these worries and these anxieties that I have truly to him and putting them on the altar. You know, sort of like, yeah, Jesus, I need some help. Um, but hold on. You know, get, let me get this breed out the microwave. Uh, you, know, I, you know, it's like, it's like, no. You need God to truly, truly come and give you peace. And that means, like Jacob, you wrestle with the angel of the Lord and don't let him go until he blesses you. Don't be trying to have these little cliche devotional times where you're just like, okay, I gotta get my 15 minutes of talk time with God, but you're still carrying your anxieties, you're still carrying your unbelief, you're still carrying your sin. And you haven't truly given it to the Lord. Philippians 3, be anxious about nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Give it to God in such a way that his peace comes into your mind and heart and it truly guards you like that exterminator, like that um, uh, pesticide. 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is encouraging Timothy, a young pastor. He's left in the city of Ephesus. Timothy, we call him timid Timothy because he tends to have a very timid nature where Paul seems to be this apostolic, courageous leader. And Paul, knowing that Timothy as a pastor was struggling in this church, he had to set down a lot of ground rules, he had to teach the people how to be a church, basically tells him in verse 8, Timothy, or, or I'm sorry, uh, verse 3, he says, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you my prayers. He says in verse four of Second Timothy chapter one, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. So it's a very personal pastoral letter. It's like, Timothy, I, I wanna see you. And anyone who's been involved in ministry knows that these kind of ministry partners are critical. You, you, you form an emotional bond because ministry is tough. And he says to Timothy, 
I remember you and your tears that when I left you there, he said, I can't wait to see you again. It's the beauty of ministry. The people you do ministry with become so close. Verse five, he says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and am now persuaded lives in you also. And look what he says in verse six, for this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God. God's giving you certain gifts, a certain calling. Let that calling burn. Don't hold back. Fan it into flame. Let the gifts of God burn in your life. You know, our logo has three flames. That flame symbolizes the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. And that's what God does when He comes into your life and you allow Him to fan the flame. He burns you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a holy fire when a Christian gives themselves to God. Tim, Paul tells Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. There's a transference of spiritual gift, spiritual anointing, spiritual power when people anoint you and lay hands on you. And then he says in verse 7, to encourage him, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. This is the verse that our sister spoke earlier. A spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. I want to encourage you that you can and I can live out the call that God has for us to become stronger in the Word of God, to memorize the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to regularly attend church and be in the Word of God with other Christians. That not only with this issue, but with every issue in your life, you can do what God has called you to.